Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sunday's Other Scripture for March 19th. I am preaching this morning on uh, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 39. It's the story of Jesus healing a man who's literally born blind and in the process getting into a confrontation with the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who it turns out are blind to Jesus being the Christ because they can't see how God would send someone who didn't think like they thought, uh, who didn't come to enforce the law uh, so that they could be considered righteous, but instead would do the things Jesus did, which is hang around with unrighteous people and uh, and and not uh, fit into their view of, of, of what makes a person good. So our readings for this morning, the other readings, uh, tie in nicely with that, especially the Old Testament reading. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I, I mentioned that uh, very often the strongest thread is between the Old Testament reading and the gospel. There's a lot of Old Testament to choose from, and the Old Testament reading is often chosen in order to not only back up the, the gospel, but also show that what Jesus did was actually anticipated in the Hebrew scriptures. And so our Old Testament reading for this morning is uh, from Isaiah chapter 42, uh, verses one, uh, 14 through 21. And in this reading, God says uh, some things that are kind of puzzling out of context. So um, I want to talk about those a little bit. He starts out by um, talking about how he has been uh, like, a, like a pregnant woman. He has been waiting to deliver uh, Israel. And he uses some very powerful language, the language of earthquakes and, and of the land being reshaped like by a flood, uh, which is common among the prophets for uh, God uh, changing the world order in order to deliver his people, in this case, Israel. And so he's been silent for a long time, uh, and yet now he's going to act and he's going to deliver his people. And then he goes on to talk about, as part of that or connected to that, I will lead the blind by ways that they have not known. By unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. Now, rough places smooth, uh, this gets quoted in, by other prophets and uh, as a description of John the Baptist, who came before Jesus uh, to uh, kind of take these, these paths and turn them into a highway for the king. Uh, but the leading of the blind by paths they haven't known, uh, this really, I think, is an image of uh, what it means to trust in God. That is, um, he takes you by the hand and he leads you, but you don't necessarily see where he's leading you. You just have to trust what God says. And this has always been the position of God's people, whereas the, the Pharisees and religious leaders thought that they had God figured out. Those who truly have faith in him learn to trust him without necessarily fully understanding what God is doing or how he operates. And, and that is really going to be a, a focus of our, our sermon this morning. And it's really set up by this Old Testament reading. Now, this is in contrast to, at the time of Isaiah, those who were trusting in idols. And the interesting thing is God goes on to say, Hear you, deaf, look, you blind and see. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I send? This is, uh, I think, sarcasm because God's messengers, the prophets specifically, but really all the faithful, were considered to be blind to the realities. You know, everybody knew there are all sorts of gods and you got you to gotta sacrifice to them if you want them to do your will. And the faithful believed in one God who couldn't be bought off. He wasn't a vending machine. He was a person. And you learned to trust him, and you obeyed him because you trusted him. But those people, this this remnant who believed in the true God, were often considered to be blind or deaf by the local culture. Uh, just as Christians today, uh, sometimes by by various aspects of culture, and I don't just mean uh, you know one side or the other. There are assumptions that people make on all sorts of political persuasions and so on that are contrary to the Christian scriptures. Christians believe things that simply aren't the common belief. Like we don't believe in taking vengeance, and yet 
you know, there, there are a lot of Christians who are kind of persuaded by vigilante movies that, you know, this is really what it means to be brave is to just, you know, boy, if somebody comes after you, you go after them full force, you know, it's kind of tribal justice. And that's not what Christians believe. Jesus very clearly opposed that type of thing. Uh, on the other side, you have people who believe, well, uh, you know, you, you've got to trust science more than God. Um, but this is not what Christians believe either. They, they believe that God made the world and he reveals himself partly through science, but he reveals himself through his word more clearly. And, uh, you know, so there are these common beliefs in our culture that um, that Christians don't buy into. And so Christians are, are considered to be blind or, or deaf. But God says, you know, you have seen many things, he says as in Isaiah, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. And, and this is even the religious leaders of Jesus' time. They saw his miracles, but they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Their ears were open. They heard God's word uh, literally through their own ears, but they didn't recognize God's word because they had uh, in it, it swallowed this whole set of rules and regulations and interpretations of God's law that turned out to be contrary to what God really wanted to teach his people and how he was really going to act in Jesus. So uh, this is uh, our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, and it really anticipates Jesus. I'm going to move on to our psalm for the day, which is Psalm 142. This is a very specific psalm in terms of its origin. Uh, it comes from a time when uh, David, who was chosen by God to be the replacement for Saul, uh, who had turned away from God. Saul had kind of gone on and done, done his own thing. So, so God anointed David to be the new king. But um, in, in the meantime, Saul was jealous of David because God granted him success as a military leader. And so Saul tries to kill David and he's pursuing David, hunting him down. And David is literally hiding in a cave in order to escape Saul. And interesting, about the time this psalm was written, uh, Saul, who's hunting David down, goes into the cave where David is hiding and uh, he has to relieve himself. And uh, it, he so he goes in by himself. It's David's chance to kill Saul but David doesn't do it. Again, he doesn't believe what the rest of his men believe about exacting vengeance. He doesn't believe that he should kill the Lord's anointed. That is the, the king that God has chosen, even if God has chosen him as the next king. And so uh, that's that's kind of the setting for this psalm. And, and in this psalm, you have uh, David just pouring out his complaint before the Lord. And, and his complaint is not against God. His complaint is against the people who are causing him trouble, specifically uh, Saul. But he writes this uh, this prayer to God in more general terms so that we can recite it as a, as a worship song. And um, he talks about, you know, how he has no refuge other than God, uh, you know, that he's out in the desert and uh, people have turned aside. Some of the people that he trusted to protect him against Saul uh, ended up betraying him. Uh, he says, they've laid a snare for me. And if you live out in the desert, and you're trying to catch your own food. Of course, a snare is a very physical image for you. Um, but God, the Lord, is his refuge. And so he calls on the Lord to be his portion in the land of the living. And, and I, I love that phrase because, you know, we have this sense of entitlement that we are entitled to a, a portion of wealth, a portion of comfort, a portion of health, a portion of all the good things in this world. David has none of those things. But he believes that God is his portion in the land of the living, not just in heaven either, but that in this life, uh, having a relationship with God is enough. It's more than enough for us. And David goes on and says, set me free from my prison. It's not a literal prison. It's the fact that he's hemmed in in this cave. And uh, he says that I may praise your name. So this is how he's motivating God, not by sacrifices or anything, but just saying, God, if you'll deliver me, I'm going to praise your name. Then the righteous will gather around me because they will see that your hand is with me. So we have this psalm a little bit less connected a lot less connected to our gospel lesson. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, the epistle reading for today. Uh, and the epistle reading for this day is actually from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Last week it was from Romans. This week it's from Ephesians. 
And the reason is kind of obvious when we get into it. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 15. And, uh, and chapter 8 starts out, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. So here we have the same image that Jesus is using, the same image that Isaiah is using, but it's post-Christ, and this time it's being used of believers. And Paul says, you used to be darkness, you used to be ignorant of God, you used to uh, do deeds of darkness. He talks about the fact that people do evil things at night because they have a sense that they won't be discovered. But of course, it's never dark to God. He can always see everything. But once we become children of the light, that is once we realize that God sees what we do, but forgives us in Christ by faith in Christ, then we're motivated to find out what pleases the Lord. As David responded, you know, I will praise you and the righteous will gather around me. In other words, I'll, I'll choose my friends more carefully. <laughs> and uh, Paul encourages the believers in Ephesus to do the same thing, right? To find out what pleases the Lord, uh, to do things that are good and that are righteous and and believe only the truth and pass along only the truth. You know, this is this is another thing that believers today struggle with not just knowing the truth, but they believe all sorts of things that they hear on the internet uh, or hear on TV and read on the internet, and they pass them along without critically thinking about, is this thing really true? Do I know it's true? And if I don't know it's true, do I have any business passing it along? And the answer biblically is no. If you do not absolutely know that it's true, you do not have any business passing it along. Uh, scripture is very clear about this. Gossip is up there in one of the top 10 uh, lists of sins that Paul lists. So, uh, you know, find out what pleases the Lord. That includes the truth. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, or we could say the fruitless words of darkness or the fruitless memes of darkness. Um, you know, uh, and then he says an interesting thing. He says, where it's shameful to even mention the things that the disobedient do in secret. But, he says, everything exposed by the light becomes visible. It kind of raises the question, if it's shameful to even mention the things that the disobedient do in secret, should that be what Christian believers are talking about? How terrible those people are and all the things that they do in secret that are evil? And the answer is no. No, that's not supposed to be our focus. In fact, we may well be sinning by spending a lot of time uh, accusing people and talking about how terrible it is, uh, it really displays a lack of trust in God and a lack of understanding uh, that Jesus came, yes, to speak to us God's word, but he mainly exposed the goodness of God through what he did, through his actions, like healing blind people and accepting tax collectors and, and sinners by doing something different than what the world does. That's how we expose the deeds of darkness, by being the light, by being different than the world. We, we expose by our purity those things that are impure. And, uh, and so Paul uh, finishes this little passage uh, that's our epistle for today with probably what we think is an er part of an early Christian praise song. Uh, it says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, you can say that this is uh, applied to the, the resurrection when Jesus returns and wakes people up, but you get a sense from this passage that Paul is not talking about the resurrection here. He's talking about our life. Wake up to what's going on around you. We, we're not supposed to stumble through life like we're asleep. We're supposed to be aware, but then rise from the dead. Separate yourself from things that are evil, from behaviors that are evil. And then he says, Christ will shine on you. That is, um, we're light in the world, not because we're such great people ourselves, but because in turning to Christ, his goodness is revealed. 
And that's really Paul's message here, that we're to reveal Christ's goodness as reflections of it. And that's why we find out what pleases the Lord. So these uh, these images of light and darkness uh, very much connect us to our gospel reading for today, as I said, where Jesus uh, heals a blind man and then reveals that it's actually the spiritually blind that he's come to judge. He's come to heal the physically blind and in doing so expose the spiritual blindness uh, of many people. So those are our readings for today. I hope that you have a great day uh, conversation about them. The Lord bless you all.